Uh, um, hello, uh, welcome back to the continuing lecture on uh, uh, return on investment. This is Dr. Jeff Holm. Now, in our previous video, um, we discussed uh, how to uh, calculate a holding period return for um, scenario one in the house value example, right? We, um, and uh, during the break, I added this uh, formula for holding period return. Um, and we did exactly, um, we did exactly this, right? We did exactly, uh, uh, we calculated uh, HPR according to this formula. Uh, but remember, in uh, scenario one, you uh, we don't have this term. This term drops out because uh, there's no uh, incidental income, right? There's no incidental cash flow in scenario one. So we calculated uh, uh, basically the capital gains, uh, this part, right, the capital gains, was 350,000, right? Uh, and uh, capital gains is by definition, right? Uh, PT plus N minus PT, or if this is PT, this will be PT minus N, right? And this term is zero because no incidental income. So we can arrive at, uh, by doing that, right? by subtracting uh, PT from PT plus N, right? We arrive that, at that and we divide it by the initial investment, right? So we got, you know, 233% and, you know, just, just you know, uh, roughly look at the, uh, uh, the numbers, just roughly, right? When you bought it, it was 150K. And when you sold it, it was 500k, and it was you know uh, there's you know roughly uh, it's like 2.3 times growth, right? Almost 233 percent growth. And also I, I could do it. I could also do it in the same. Uh, I could get to the same result, but um, uh, what I did here was you know actually you can do it. Uh, by uh, see uh, the capital gains you can also um, find the capital gains uh, this way right you can find the capital gains this way uh, If and this actually, this is because oh, there's no capital gains. Uh, you just you just bought it. You just bought this. Uh, there was, you know, there was something there, there was data, but, you know, um, you just bought it at the end of 2005. So during the uh, 2005, there was no capital gains. It just uh, tagged along, right? Because as I uh, dragged it down and because there was uh, data here, uh, which, you know, uh, is actually not the... Uh, house value of 2004 is just the uh, sum of all these numbers. Uh, I mean, the difference between this and this. But here, I did it also uh, this way. If you look at, um, if you look at uh, this column and, and into this cell, you see uh, I summed uh, all the annual 
capital gains. And then if you sum all the annual capital gains, that would be exactly the total capital gains, right? So either way, um, you divide it by initial investment, and there you go. Now, this time, now let's think about the uh, uh, scenario two. And in scenario two, uh, you rent it out, right? In other words, uh, we will add in this term, right? We will add in. Uh, so it's nothing new. So uh, let's see what how I got this number, right? That's the total, of course. Um, that's basically, you know, um, uh, all this uh, rental incomes, right, from... Um, uh, the first year through uh, the final year, right? Of course, uh, I can include uh, 2005 as well because that's time zero. But look, um, anyway, 2005, uh, we didn't own the house, right? We just bought it at the end of 2005. So there was no uh, rental income. We couldn't even rent it out. So it's zero anyway, so it doesn't do any harm uh, to include it, but then it doesn't make any sense, right? I mean, it's not necessary to include uh, the data of the year that didn't exist, okay? All right, so, uh, so some of, in other words, some of all uh, these rental incomes uh, was that. So all you need to do is, I did it here, right? What did I do? Uh, basically, uh, capital gains, right? This minus this, B2 minus B13, capital gains, plus uh, sum of all the uh, uh, cash flows or uh, sum of all the uh, rental income, and then divide it by, right? initial investment, you get, you know, 347, 347%, almost 348%. Uh, same thing here, but, you know, simply um, <clears throat> basically uh, this is C14 is the capital gains, right? That's the, uh, the final result. And uh, some of all the uh, uh, incidental income, right, or uh, rental income, right? So there you go. Now our next question is then, um, this is holding period return. But as I told you, it's important to know what is the, uh, it's important to know what is the, uh, Annualized, ret uh, annualized return. Or uh, now, let's think about it. Uh, the annualized return is necessary because all the returns are basically expressed uh, as annual. They ha all the returns will eventually ha have to uh, uh, be expressed in. Uh, annual terms. Why? Because I've been telling you. Well, you cannot make comparison between different uh, returns of uh, from different holding periods, right? And besides, uh, if you're obviously the uh, uh, very fundamental and very uh, basic uh, reference point when you are making an investment, is the bank interest rate. Isn't that right? I mean, if bank interest rate is high, you would compare uh, the return from investment uh, with the bank interest rate because bank interest rate is risk-free, right? If the bank's uh, interest rate is 5%, that means they are going to pay you 5%, you know, during uh, annually, right? Uh, which is Guaranteed, bank interest rate doesn't, uh, when you, um, uh, they can change, you know, bank interest rate can change, but once, uh, uh, 
once you lock into a contract like CD, Certificate of Deposit, uh, they cannot change, right? During the contract period, right? The CD interest rate is binding for the contract period. So if the CD interest rate is 5%, Certificate of Deposit, then it's um, uh, risk-free, guaranteed for the uh, contract period. Uh, and if you think about it, um, when you are uh, putting money into a CD, it's like lending money, right? With a loan contract. And when you write up, a, uh, when you sign the loan contract, um, the interest rate is fixed, right? So you can just, instead of putting yourself in the borrower position, when because generally when you, uh, when we say loans, you easily think about borrowing money. Yes, you can be at a borrower's um, standpoint, or you can be at the lender's standpoint. And most, most of the times you would think about yourself in the borrower's standpoint. But if you borrow money anyway, think about it. You borrow for... Uh, three years, and then there is an interest rate which is fixed. This fixed interest rate on the loan doesn't change with the uh, uh, market interest rate. In other words, the interest rate in the uh, market, uh, lending and borrowing market uh, will uh, change you know, um, uh, frequently, right? I wouldn't say it's changing constantly, but it ch it can change, right? Um, depending on the uh, benchmark interest rate of the Federal Reserve, right? Uh, so one day, you know, uh, you see the sign, uh, our cities are paying 2.75%, but a year, a year later, then our CD rate is now 1.5. Why? Because the market interest rate changes, you know, constantly. I mean, you know, um, in the market, actually, in the uh, actual rate changes constantly. But you cannot borrow money uh, in the long run, right, if that rate on your loan changes every day. Make sense? So you lock into a rate. When you are locking, uh, when you are getting a loan, you lock into a rate. So now if you're putting your money in, in, uh, the CD, you are a lender. You are becoming a lender to the bank. And the bank is getting into a borrower position. And then they will, you know, pay, they are uh, paying you a fixed rate. So if the, uh, think about it, then it is a, uh, um, a very safe rate. It's a, uh, uh, a risk free rate, right? Because as long as the um, uh, as long as the bank is uh, doing its business, right? As long as the bank is you know uh, uh, around, you know, doing business, uh, they will pay you that interest. And you you may still continue. You may still ask, now what if the bank failed? Uh, there is then you know uh, what they call FDIC. Okay. Uh, FDIC. So um, I'm going to get to FDIC later, which is like an insurance for the commercial banks. So uh, don't worry about it. Uh, the interest rate they, uh, uh, on the CDs are guaranteed. Now think about it. Then with the same money, right, you could have invested the same money into, put it, you could have put it into stocks, right? Or you could have uh, used that money, uh, you know, 150K to buy a house. And uh, over, you know, your CD is just three years, right? The CD's, you know, uh, maturity is three years. And this house was, you know, you held it for 11 years. So obviously you can't make a direct comparison because the uh, holding periods are different. That's why you need to uh, annualize, right? And 
uh, when, uh, also, since the uh, interest rate on the CD was already you know, 5% annual, now if you annualize the, whole, uh, the total return from the uh, stock, and then you can compare it with the CD, and um, you can tell which one was better, right? Okay, so our next question is then, how do we annualize it? Uh, remember, you are comparing it with the uh, interest rate on the CD because it is risk-free, right? And if our stock did better, an annual return on the stock was better, or higher, then, you know, clearly uh, it's indisputable stock did better, right? Or although the um, uh, uh, this house value, in, in this example, our holding period return was... 233% in scenario one and 348% in scenario two. If you annualize it over 11 years, right? Across 11 years, annualize it across 11 years, right? Uh, it may not, uh, we don't, uh, it may not be better than 5% uh, interest rate on CD, right? So we don't know that yet. Uh, so we need to annualize it. So then, what is annualizing? I mean, what is annualization? Annualization is simply taking the average. But here, we have a problem. Um, so you might think, oh, so if I take the average of these, you know, uh, this total return, oh, so it's simply this divided by 11, because it's 11 years. Divide, you know. Then 11 per, uh, dividing by 11. If you divide it by 11, it would be almost like 20%, don't you think? I mean, just roughly <laughs> uh, calculating. Um, if I do, if I divide this by 11, that's 21%, right? If I uh, turn it into a percentage. Uh, and give it always two decimal places. Um, uh, make a habit of, this is by default, at least give two decimal places. Right? Uh, then uh, you would say, all right, you know. I, now, um, of course, you know, uh, uh, the annualized return would be better than uh, 5%, uh, but actually it's not 21%. First of all, this is wrong. Why? Now, let me uh, uh, let me switch to uh, our uh, let me switch to the, uh, the PowerPoint. And but before we go, uh, the reason it is wrong is because what you think about average is. Uh, what you understand as average is a simple average or arithmetic average. It's not the, uh, and a simple average or arithmetic average is not the uh, appropriate one to use in this case. Now, let me switch to uh, all right. So now do you see this um, yeah, uh, slide? OK. So what was that? Uh, uh, simple average and what? Now, when, uh, when we talk about average, there are uh, two different types of average, simple average and weighted average. OK. Simple average is also called arithmetic average. And it's simply, um, that's what you generally understand. Uh, so you divide sum of all the uh, observations, observe the data, right? You sum all the observed data and divide it by number of observations. This notation, you should be familiar with that. Um, the I stands for individual observation or individual data. Uh, and so this is the uh, the number of that particular data. 
So uh, we have 11 observations. So then, you know, uh, I runs from 1 through 11. And then XI is each individual observed the data. So when uh, the first one, first observed data is X1, second observed data is X2, and so on. Uh, <clears throat> but the weighted av uh, then weighted average is um, the opposite concept of simple average, but the opposite concept of arithmetic average is geometric average. Now I, I just said simple average is the same thing as arithmetic average, but how come they are different? Uh, how come their uh, counter concepts are different? Their counterparts are different. Um, actually, it's yes and no. They are uh, weighted average. Geometric average is also a kind of uh, weighted average. Geometric average is, you know, uh, 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 time weighted average. Time weighted, right? So first of all, let's. Um, look into the concept of uh, weighted average. A very good example of weighted average is the your GPA. And let's take a look at your GPA uh, calculation. Um, suppose you took, um, in the last, uh, last semester, you took three, uh, four courses, right? English, math, um, African, Latino studies, some ethnic studies, art, and uh, their uh, each um, uh, English classes generally uh, have three credits. Math carries four credits. Uh, ethnic studies uh, generally three credits, but there are there used to be two credit ethnic studies courses. Art, art, music, and arts. Um, it's hard to find one credit course these days, but there was one credit course in the past. That means you know, three credit courses generally meet um, three hours a week, four credit courses, four hours. Uh, and one credit course you know, is generally one hour per week. So that means you know, um, uh, even if math, uh, some four credit courses, even if they meet three hours a week, still uh, the credit um, can be four. And why do they have different uh, credits? Uh, because these different credits mean the different weight they carry, right? Different weight means what? Uh, when your uh, what does that mean? Weight means importance, right? Uh, if someone's voice carries more importance, uh, they say uh, his voice carries more weight in this matter. Right? Makes sense. Um, so uh, they they mean the different you know weights. Now suppose you got B plus in English, B in math, uh, A minus in uh, uh, African studies, and um, uh, A in art. And B plus is in terms of grade points, B plus is three point five. I mean A is four, right? A minus three point seven. Uh, B plus 3.5 and uh, B 3.2. So you might think, oh, my GPA must be a, a you know average of this. And when you, what you're saying is uh, actually simple average of uh, these great points. But actually that is wrong, right? Simple average is wrong. Uh, why? Uh, so let me uh, stop. Let me uh, go back to the Excel file. So stop sharing this and so let me take you to uh, okay here. And of course, this file is you know uh, located in the. Uh, uh, you know, a course materials folder, right? So uh, this Excel file. So um, I rebuilt it in uh, Excel. English, three, math. 
So great points are like this. So you would easily think, uh, I'll sum it up. I'll add them up and divide it by uh, four because there are four courses. Uh, so I did it. Uh, that's exactly what it is. You might wonder, oh, what? No, well, first of all, you're summing up, right? You're summing up these four uh, uh, numbers, right? Some d2 through d5. And divide by, uh, now instead of you know, simply entering four, I, I did it this way. Because if you enter four there, you cannot reuse it. Right? You cannot recycle it. It's called hard coding. If you actually not enter a actual number, an actual number there, then number cannot be changed when you uh, uh, um, replicate this model somewhere else. For example, if I if I copy this model, paste uh, somewhere else, like here, and if I have five uh, courses five classes, result of five courses, or six courses, then um, when I do that, this, and if I entered four manually there, then this four won't automatically adapt to the new environment. It will just, you know, uh, still be four. That's why it is called hard coding. But if you do the hard coding, then you cannot recycle that model. That is, then totally that defeats the purpose of uh, building anything on Excel. Uh, if you're doing using a computer software, why are you doing that? Because you want to uh, uh, automate the process. You understand? You don't want to manually do everything. So um, if you uh, enter four there, then when you re um, when you build a new model uh, in a new situation, you will have to uh, change every number uh, manually. And that's a very dumb thing. You don't want to do that. I mean, as long as you're using a, you know, uh, uh, using computer, you want the computer to uh, execute uh, the command, and you just want to provide the logic to it. Uh, so therefore, I did. I used the count command. Count means, you know, uh, actually, it doesn't have to be B through. Uh, I, I will count uh, this. That means, you know, how many data points are there, and it will automatically count uh, four, right? So if I um, copy and paste it to a new problem. Uh, environment to new problem uh, uh, parameters, then if I have six uh, classes there, and it will count the number of, you know, uh, data points, and it's going to automatically put six there. But as I said, uh, you can, um, this is wrong, because this is, you know, a simple average. And also, you can uh, find a simple average simply by using uh, average command. And then it will give you a simple average, right? But again, uh, that's not what we want to do. Why? Uh, this is wrong. It's not your GPA. Why? Your GPA has to be a weighted average. Why? Because their weights are different, right? These courses have different weights. Math is most important. That's why it has four uh, credits. Uh, some people may. Uh, disagree, but you know, you can't deny it. You can't deny the fact that the math requires the most, most uh, uh, brain power, your cerebral power, really. Uh, nothing else requires more cerebral power uh, than the math or math based uh, subjects like physics, finance, economics, right? So uh, then, how do you calculate the weighted average? So uh, what I do, uh, what I did here is, let's take a look. Um, first, what did I do here? I literally weighted. I literally applied the weight to this grade point. Grade points. So three times 
this, right? And then that. And also, uh, then I, uh, what do I do? I simply drag it down. Okay? I drag it down. I drag it down. And then what do I do? Uh, this is the sum, right? Sum of, I already built it in there. Sum of all these great uh, weighted points. And this is what? Sum of all the credits. Right? And then, uh, so your uh, GPA is the weighted average. So uh, you will need to divide this weighted uh, uh, grade points by the total of the uh, credits. And then you get 3.47. So this is the uh, weighted average, right? Now, again, what did what? Uh, what is relevant in our example is not the uh, the weighted average, it's the geometric average, right? So um, our time is up. So um, uh, we'll discuss further. Um, I'll have to uh, stop the video here, and we'll discuss uh, further uh, about the geomet. We'll discuss geometric average further in our next video. All right, thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.